So my name is Victoria Garza and I'm a major in biomedical science. So specifically the title of my research project is the um, protective mechanisms of, of the synthetic triterpenoid CDDOEA in insulin resistance. Um, so basically what that is, is we're just kind of looking at the protective um, mechanisms in the specific compound CDDOEA and we're trying to look to see how it protects, protects against insulin resistance in uh, type 2 diabetes. Um, we're trying to uh, fight this condition that is so prevalent in the valley and we're really just trying to make an impact and overall just contribute to treatment. Well, um, so as I mentioned, um, type 2 diabetes is very prevalent here in the valley. Diabetes in general is just very significant and um, I joined a lab specific with diabetes. It's something that's very um, big in my family. Um, my father included has diabetes and that was just something that I wanted to contribute to on um, more of a personal um, on more of a personal note. Um, but in regards to the project itself, the compound, um, based on our preliminary data that had been gathered um, prior to my arrival at the lab, um, they had just kind of been determined that it might have protective mechanisms that could better insulin resistance and kind of increase, ins in increase insulin sensitivity and um, insulin signaling. And so we decided to focus our research, well, the research project funded by ESA, um, on that specific um, compound to see if it would work out. Okay, in regards to classes to take, so I'm quite fortunate to be a biomedical science major and we focus a lot of our classes and coursework, um, the curriculum itself is based on the human body, um, how the human body will react to pathogens and just conditions itself. So the courses itself derived from the BMED department have better prepared me for my research in general. Um, I mean, but if they were not a biomedical science major, then uh, in a biology major, I mean, of course, anatomy, you wanna look at the skeletal muscle, you wanna look at um, things like that. Pathology, that would be something that I would kind of look into, um, just kind of understanding different types of receptors and just the mechanism in general. Um, however, if they did not have a background in biomedical science or biology, I guess just kind of doing more research on the insulin pathway, um, just kind of analyzing that. Maybe if you wanted to go a little bit more um, uh, uh, broad in the aspect, I mean, you could even look at a genetic, stand genetic standpoint um, to see, I mean, in terms of like, possibility of developing type of diabetes, what makes people more prone, um, environmental factors, so on and so forth. Well, I think it's definitely very beneficial for someone to have a lot of knowledge, but I'm proud to say that in my laboratory, we have two freshmen that work well. So um, they do a lot to contribute um, as well. They just recently started. So I was already going through my ESAA process, but um, through then, um, there are two seniors and two freshmen, and so um, so it's me and my lab mate Samantha. She and I kind of help um, are helping train them into understanding procedures such as Western blots, how to read, how to read them, how to analyze them, the quantification aspects, and um, kind of just explaining the science. But also, I'm very fortunate to have an amazing PI who. Um, just has been overall very, very supportive. So I think if you work with the right research mentor, there's nothing you can't handle. I think at the like at this point in time, I think diabetes is something that is being really, really looked into at this point, treatment wise. Um, I think that Type 2 diabetes isn't something that's being looked at too much in research, at least um, not my understanding, but of course they hold diabetes conferences, so I'd assume that there would be exponential amount of research <laughs> being conducted at this point in time. My research um, is something that is going to ultimately contribute to the community as well, um, and I think that it kind of collaborates with current research projects being done because it, I mean, it might be a small part, but in the end, it could make a big difference. <laughs> well, 
Well, I would say that the methodology that we use, kind of Western blots, um, protein assays, I would say that that's relatively common um, to just kind of analyze signaling pathways and you know get concentrations and so on and so forth. But I wouldn't necessarily call it mainstream considering the fact that the compound that we use is synthesized, so it's extremely specific. It's not necessarily a natural, um, a natural compound that you can uh, go find out in nature. It's something that would have to be synthesized in a laboratory, so it's, um, uh, yeah, I wouldn't necessarily refer to it as an entry. <laughs> well, I think to treat diabetes in general, something that we learn um, in the BEMA department and just BEMA classes in general is that healthy eating and exercise and as cliche as it might sound you know i'm sure that it's very very repetitive in regards to the field of research but it works so in order to increase insulin signaling and insulin sensitivity the first place to start would be with a healthy diet your uh, overall environment you want to make sure you're positive and staying healthy exercising that's something that's really really important but for those that um, are a bit further along, they need additional assistance where although healthy eating and exercise are helping, sometimes they need, you know, like I said, additional assistance. And so that is where our synthetic compound would come and um, kind of play a part in overall bettering their, their stature. Well, so hypothetically speaking, if I were a physician and someone were to come and tell me, um, well, I don't necessarily see a point in going and taking care of myself because it's your job to treat me. I think that the best way that I could approach that, of course, if I were to be a physician, someone advising someone, I would never turn someone away if they are in regard to assistance. I think it's important um, for people to definitely take care of themselves, but as a physician and ethically speaking, you wouldn't necessarily be able to comment. Of course, you can strive to um, promote wellness and taking care of yourself, but you can't necessarily force someone to do anything. It's kind of that saying, you know, you can lead a horse to water, but you can't make them drink. Um, it's kind of, you know, something that is very, common i think people have a misconception that medicine is the solver of everything but if you think about it if you take care of yourself earlier if you eat healthy you exercise you surround yourself in a positive environment uh, where you're able to properly regulate yourself then i mean not only does your health improve significantly but you save on costs and now that's a universal language that everyone speaks money <laughs> so and that's something that i would kind of promote in that aspect as to kind of get someone's attention i think if someone was like really really negative on that perspective then that would be something i would kind of use to pinpoint um or to kind of add to you know support my reasoning Well, so the Engaged Scholar Symposium was my second symposium ever, participating in my second poster session. Um, I think it was something that definitely gave me more confidence. So I think in regards to the changes, like how it changed me as a researcher, it definitely gave me more confidence, especially as um, an undergrad. Um, I'm currently on the way to a PhD doctoral program. So I was accepted to UTSA's biomedical uh, engineering PhD program, which I'll be starting in the fall. And where I I'm going to need to present my research and kind of articulate my findings and just keep everything organized. And I think the Engaged Scholars Symposium or just presenting my research in general is something that is going to better serve me in the future because I'm going to be able to be a little bit more prepared, um, you know, uh, in regards to structuring posters. And I think um, it helped me improve my communication skills, um, you know, kind of get rid of those last minute jitters because you know your research. And so all in all, um, I feel that presenting this research definitely helped me uh, improve my personal growth, not in regard to my research and academic growth. Um, I think it significantly impacted me as well because I was able to better formulate my ideas. It assisted me in abstract writing. Um, it assisted me in kind of um, determining my scientific methods, my scientific goals, um, and it was something that kind of kept me very motivated and very determined overall, very, very focused and organized, I have to say.
So when I first started my undergraduate degree, I was motivated to go to medical school. I wanted to be a doctor and I wanted to help people and you know, I thought that was the best way that I could do it by becoming a physician and going to medical school. But then I got my first exposure to research. Um, I mean, well, definitely in BMED classes, we have to take research courses. So that was my first introduction. I developed a little bit of an interest, but it wasn't as in depth to where I could say that I genuinely loved it. Um, but then as time progressed, I got my first research opportunity at Texas A&M where I got to study genetics and genomics in um, their uh, summer undergraduate research program. And it kind of just, you know, built my interest even more. And then I got to come back to UTRGV and now I've been working for the same PI for close to two years now. And all in all, it's just kind of built my interest so much more. So I think with research itself, it's something that you definitely have to be motivated to do. Um, you have to really, really love what you do. And it's something that my advice would be don't get too frustrated, don't be too hard on yourself because even if something doesn't work out in the beginning, that's the whole point of research, going and figuring things out. Now, myself uh, included in regards to many individuals in research, I love to figure out how things work, how things um, how things can, um, how to improve problems. And so I would suggest um, for those when you go to medical school, just kind of to acknowledge that being a doctor isn't the only way you can help someone because I was very tunnel, tunnel vision until I got my first opportunity, my first introduction. And I realized that going and getting a PhD was something that I could help someone and it was something that I was very passionate about. Of course, I'm passionate about medicine, I'm passionate about helping people, but I think it's that problem solving skills and then that collaboration with your team, um, just kind of working through. And I think it doesn't hurt to have, like I previously mentioned, a successful mentor who's very, um, who's very supportive, definitely um, created a very supportive environment. So um, yeah, I guess that would just be my advice, you know, be open-minded. <laughs>
Well, I think that anyone's motivation towards research holds value. Whatever your motivation to participate, whether it be personal, whether it be just kind of out of, let me build my resume <laughs> in that aspect, I think it doesn't hurt because in the end, you're gonna get out a lot. You're gonna learn a lot of lessons. You're going to get a lot of um, guidance and support and just kind of uh, assistance and help and I mean, in addition, I mean, well, prior to what I had mentioned, I had originally wanted to go to medical school. I had um, communicated that with my PI at the very beginning. She had already sent a student undergraduate um, researcher from a prior year who was also an engaged scholar. Um, she had sent him to medical school. So it's not impossible. So I got into PhD, he got into medical school. And so it just kind of depends on your motivations. But I think no matter what your reasoning I mean, it's still a win for research in addition because you're able to contribute, um, I think, but really to participate, you, your heart really has to be in it. You're, you're, you have to be very determined, very motivated because it can get difficult, it can get frustrating. But as you participate and you go through time and you learn how to critical, um, critically think and you learn how to problem solve, it definitely like improves your skills. So whether whatever your motivation is, I think um, anyway, you're gonna get a lot out of it. Well, I thought long and hard about this question when I saw that. I thought, what, what about it? Like, what about what I'm doing is going to make any contribute to the world? I go to a university in South Texas. I, you know, y y you, you feel like you're much, you, you look at the world and you realize how small you actually are. But what I've realized that in research, there are no small contributions. There are new diseases happening every day, new conditions. It's kind of contributing. If you read publications, it'll tell you this worked. And then some publications will say, well, this didn't work. But in any contribution that you make, now you know, let's not pursue this avenue, but let's pursue this one. Oh wait, someone was getting somewhere with this. Let's work together. What I've noticed about research is it's really just a network of collaborations and just kind of working with each other. Yes, your research and your data is definitely original, but it's important to also kind of learn from others and kind of be able to you know, critically think and just kind of learn from others' mistakes, learn from others' successes, and just kind of realize, well, this is going to make a difference. And it's going to make a difference understanding the world because you need to know which path to take. And I think that with every research study that's being done, anything that's being communicated, discovered right now, there is so much data that is being, I, I bet, processed right now, <laughs> this very second, that is going to help us kind of get somewhere understanding diseases, conditions, um, mechanisms, you know, the pathology of all of it. And I think that that's something that's really, really beneficial because it's definitely gonna make a change in the way we see medicine and the way we see the world. Because I mean, years ago, if people did not, if people didn't uh, do research, if they didn't analyze things and they just kind of thought, well, what, what would I, you know, what would come of what I do? I'm just one person. I'm just doing one research study. I, I come from somewhere very small, underrepresented, so on and so forth. You know, what, what is that gonna do? Well, wait a minute, okay. Well, what I did contributed to the treatment of conditions. It treat, contributed to the treatment of disease. If someone had given up, we wouldn't have vaccines. We wouldn't have had medications. And there's new things being developed every day that could better human life. And I mean, all in all, the importance of research, the importance of medicine, healthcare is just to improve overall quality of life. And that's just something that I think is vital to um, to overall progress society. And because I mean, all in all, we want to make the world a better place for everyone. <laughs>
in regard to being an engaged scholar. Something that I really, really learned is how to better my scientific writing. Um, that is something that I would recommend um, for individuals wanting to pursue research is to kind of apply to this program, seek guidance, because your mentor is going to help you. Um, I mean, with the assistance of this uh, conference and you know this award in general, I was able to definitely better my scientific writing skills. And in fact, I just submitted my first doctoral fellowship application recently. So I think that having that practice is something that significantly, I think, better my chances in a way of um, properly writing and just kind of developing my ideas. Um, it is something that really helped me and then um, building confidence. This conference definitely helped me build my confidence, um, helped me become, I think, a little bit more outspoken in regard to, especially about my research. I definitely felt more confident after presenting my poster session. I thought, you know, originally I was a bit nervous. I mean, even though I've been working on this for a whole year, you know, when you present on something and especially something that you're so passionate about, you get a bit nervous because you don't necessarily know how the whole interaction is going to go and you just want to make sure that you're able to convey the information correctly. But through the poster session, the questions from the judges, the questions from students, faculty, um, individuals that had just come in general, um, I think that I was able to significantly get my point across. And I think it definitely helped me better, like I said, my communication skills. And I think that it just overall gave me more confidence and um, support for my, my ideas. All right, well, yeah, um, I definitely had experience with that at the symposium. I had um, a group of individuals, they had come up to my poster and I think they were just kind of in between classes and, you know, they just kind of stopped in and I was like, oh, hi, you know, can I tell you a little bit about my project, my research? And they said, oh, yeah, sure. And I said, okay, well, who here is familiar with insulin resistance? Yeah. <laughs> and I was like, okay, um, do you know what insulin is? Do you know what, like, what causes it? And, um, and I was like, okay, well then let's, you know, let me go ahead and explain to you. I think the important part is not making anyone feel insignificant in regard to understanding things because they, whether they want to learn or not, they're here to listen. And I mean, for me personally, I love to talk about, you know, what I do because I'm very passionate. So the way I was able to explain it, because also you don't want to oversimplify because I think that that can also hurt some people's feelings <laughs> as well. Um, just kind of going in depth. Um, fortunately, um, my project itself, it focused on a group of uh, well, mice that we focused on with a high fat diet, a low fat diet, and then the high fat and the low fat with the compound in general. And that was kind of something that I was able to convey to the individuals that were unfamiliar with insulin resistance and just kind of the um, impacts diabetes can have on an individual and the way I was kind of just able to explain it is like okay well yeah this is just very unhealthy this is healthy and then this is unhealthy but it has and I mean of course everyone understands compound and so um, I didn't necessarily get too much into the mechanism of it all because um, I think it's better to kind of just briefly explain because you don't want to confuse anyone either you want them to be with you until the end of the until the end of your discussion um, and I think it was overall very beneficial They had questions for me and I think it's important that if there's someone that doesn't necessarily understand what your goal like what you're talking about your research especially because I mean, if I were to walk up and say uh, synthetic terpenoid, you know, CTG, what? like, you know, I don't really understand. Um, like, if I didn't have that background, then, I mean, how would I want someone to convey to me? You know what I mean? I wouldn't want someone to kind of diminish my intelligence by kind of, you know, speaking very quickly or just kind of being overly scientific because then I'm not going to understand anything. And that's not what research is about. Research is about not just individuals in science, but it's also for the community, especially with diabetes. It's something that's so prevalent in the community that it's important for individuals and just students in general, families, you know, the older generation as well, to kind of get a better understanding of that something's being done, that something's being done and we're doing our best to combat it. And, I mean, and in my portion and at a research level.
Well, in regard to the Hispanic family, so I myself, uh, I'm Mexican and I'm also Guatemalan. Um, and well, diabetes is something that is very prevalent in my family, just in general. Both my grandparents on my dad's side have type two. Um, a lot of my tias and tios are all, um, they have diabetes, um, type one and, or they're, pre uh, like they, they're pre-diabetes. And my father um, has type one diabetes. He was recently diagnosed and you know, and what's crazy to me is they were all athletes. They were all athletes. They were very healthy. They all, you know, were very, um, they participated in a lot of physical activity. And that was just something that, you know, I definitely admired. And I myself, you know, I was an athlete, a competitive athlete growing up. And But I have to say that going to tournaments and going running around and, you know, so on and so forth. And I mean, like, it was just very difficult. My family also, not only that, I think it also depends on like a person's family and what they do. Both of my parents work in higher education. I myself am a college student. My younger brother also a college student. But growing up, my parents didn't have a lot of time to cook healthy meals. So I was eating out three times a day growing up. And it was just something that is very, very difficult um, to kind of maintain health. You know, and then it wasn't until, um, you know, I decided to take action. I started eating healthier, continuing the exercise, and I started working on myself more that I was able to realize, oh, you know, this is why, because <laughs> those who don't learn from history are doomed to repeat it. And so I had to have an epiphany. And I think that in like the, my current generation, you know, it's something that a lot of people are starting to acknowledge. Hey, wait a minute. Okay, yes, my grandparents have diabetes. My tios and tias, they have diabetes. My parents have diabetes, you know. That is just something that I think that the younger generation needs to learn from. And whether you're Hispanic, African-American, Caucasian, it's something that if it's prevalent in your family, it's up to you to make that change. And so, I mean, of course, I, you know, I'll eat fajita, I'll, I'll drink sodas, you know, my, my abuela personally, she'll have, she has Cokes, you know, they're for everybody. She doesn't, you know, she'll have water, of course, but, you know, I mean, when you're eating fajita, it's like, what we'll tastes better, <laughs> Coke or water? And it's just kind of, you know, but making those decisions, I mean, it's not harmful every now and then. I'm not going to say that, it, you know, I don't drink sodas because I do enjoy sodas as well as almost as much as I enjoy water of course um, but I think it's important to maintain a balance if you're exercising healthy if you're kind of being a little bit more conscious about what you eat um, then overall I mean again regardless of your ethnicity or race it's just something that needs to be kind of acknowledged and at this point in time in our age it's just something that has to be addressed I think it kind of just depends because like my relatives were very athletic when they were younger and so, but then as they got older, they started working jobs. Like I said, my, my, both my parents work in higher education. They don't have time. You know, they're in back-to-back -back meetings. My father, I mean, he has meetings from 8 a.m. and then board meetings until like 9 p.m. So they're working all day. My mom as well, she'll do, she herself does research as well and she'll be typing and until 2 a.m. researching and, you know, and it's just something that, I mean, all in all, it's very, very difficult, of course, right? But you don't necessarily have the time, and it, but it's about making that time, you know? And it's just kind of having like the support of your family, so, you know, to assist my father and to show support for my father, because I also think that it's kind of, um, lack of a better way to put it, but rude. <laughs> I mean, if, you know, my father, you know, has diabetes, how cool, my graduation is coming up this Friday. And so I ordered a specific sugar-free, you know, keto cake for him because how would that be fair? I'm going to be eating a cake and he's going to be sitting there watching me. So it's also about creating a supportive environment for your relatives as well because they have to know that they're not combating this alone because it's much easier to slip up, you know, because of the temptation. I mean, especially someone that has diabetes, of course, they probably had an influx of, you know, junk food growing up they probably became very accustomed to eating out drinking sugary drinks and then now they have to make this lifestyle change and it's kind of unfair you know to have those around you kind of not make any changes along with you and i think it's just important to show support if i were to see first research opportunity me um i think i would definitely tell her to 
not give up. Just keep motivated. It seems like it's so difficult and it seems like the most impossible thing in the world. And, you know, yeah, it's frustrating because, you know, a project didn't work, something didn't happen. But as time goes on, we make these changes, we make opportunities for ourselves to better yourself. And you never know what's going to come along. You know, the saying, one door closes, you know, life opens a window. It's kind of, you know, just seeking opportunities. So I think that that's just something that I would advise anyone is always seek opportunity. Do not get discouraged by what others say or, well, no one else is um, doing this. Um, be different. It's important to be different because by being the same, you're never going to progress in life and you're not going to be a competitive applicant anywhere. But if you make yourself different, if you look at the alternative routes and you really, really kind of determine what your passion is, especially at an early age, early in your career, then you have more opportunity to be successful. I mean, you know, as I started, I had no idea. I, I had no idea what a Western wall was. I didn't know what a protein acid was. And I mean, most of these undergraduate researchers that start out, I mean, as I said, I'm uh, assisting uh, mentors and freshmen, um, and they didn't know what a Western wall was. They didn't know what a protein acid was, you know, how to keep a lab notebook. And I think it's just important to provide guidance as well, because, and as well as a supportive environment. I mean, of course you have your, your PI, but it's also about building a, a bit of a more of a, a community within your, your peers. And I mean, it's something that's a different experience. Just kind of enjoy it, enjoy it.